Good morning, Bethesda. <laughs> Psalms 34 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. So this morning, as we worship the Lord, as we praise the Lord, remember that. Remember as you, whatever you're walking through today. Whatever, if you're walking through anything hard, if you're walking through blessings of, um, of him, that you would remember to praise him no matter your circumstance. No matter what you're walking through. Because he says continuously, at all times. So praise him with your mouth this morning. Worship him. Lay it at his feet. Come to the table and dine, as Pastor Sean talked about yes, last, last Sunday. Dine with him.
your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. cross at the 
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Because you have no What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of
keep going. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Come on, if you believe it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that is who you are. 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 Sing that is who you are. That is who you are. Promise keep mine in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yes, it is. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep mine in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep Line in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way make a miracle work, promise keep a line in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that is who you are. That is who you are.
glad to walk with him every day. You can turn me down just a little. We're fixing to worship the Lord in our tithes and giving. Now I know we might get this mindset, and you've heard this. You might get this mindset, oh, well, it's just the same old thing. Drop it, in a, drop it in a pan. I've been in churches when they don't say nothing. They just pass a, pass a bucket, whatever, and it's just a routine. Okay, time to do it. But it's a personal thing. I, I see it very personal. When you look at the Word and you look at the Scriptures in the Old Testament and the New of the tithe, I'd like to give us just a little bit here. If you're listening this morning or if you're with us, let me get some glasses on here and I can read it. Tithe means 10. As in 10th percent of your income. One of the most important principles of, of the tithe, however, is not that it's just 10%. It's the first 10%. In other words, God challenges you to pay your tithe before you pay your bills or spend money on anything else. Remember, the Old Testament saints were to give first fruits of their fields. And you can find this in Exodus 23 and 16. In this way, you are tithing by faith in that you are giving God His share before you deal with your purchases or expenses. Thus, you must trust Him to provide the rest of your needs and desires. This is one of the key elements that establishes the tithe in the New Testament principle. You're giving by faith and not by law. We walk by faith, church. We walk by faith. We live by faith in the God that we serve. And His promises are true. We're declaring them right now over us. Maybe you're not at a point in your life that you've surrendered to Him as Savior. Today is a great day for that, because man, He will just change you. He will change your thoughts. He will change everything in your life if you allow it, and allow Him to become Lord of your life, for He rules and reigns, and you walk by faith. Giving is something Christ mentioned a lot about giving, and we all have to give. The tithe is not just a gift either. It's your franchise payment for God's partnership in your life. The most extraordinary franchise opportunity that will ever come your way. In other words, you owe God the tithe. Furthermore, the tithe is to be paid to the storehouse, typically your church, the place that provides with you spiritual meat and milk. You don't get to des designate your tithe to a certain activity or person. It goes to God. It's not a choice. I can't say, well, I'm going to give my tithe to Ricky this week. I feel like he needs a little extra. No, it goes to God because it's his. He's given you the other 90%. We are to be found faithful stewards of what God's given us. Not only your finances, but the automobile that you drive, the car that you, or the house that you live in, the clothes that you wear. We are to be good stewards over what God's given us. It's not yours, it's God's. Therefore, you cannot control it. If you ask God to partner with you in life and you don't pay God his 10% dividend, he calls it robbery. You have basically ripped off your business partner and embezzled your stockholder's money. Now, that's the way we would look at that today, but that's, he says, you robbed me. How have you robbed me? By not giving tithes and offerings. That's not optional, church. Telling the truth is not optional. We are to tell the truth, right? Well, I, I, I can tell the truth or lie. No. And not be in right standing with the Lord, you can't. When you give money above the tithe, which is everything above 10%, it's called an offering. Your generosity begins above the tithe. You have the freedom to give that offering to anyone or designated places. God has given you authority over 90% of your income to do with it as you see fit. He wants you to be a generous with your money, the 90% that he is, as he is with his portion. Philippians 4.19 says he will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
that is a promise. We're singing about those this morning, and he is faithful. I pray that you're living that way. If not, get on board. He will change your life. When you live by faith, you will, you will get that out first. You will write that out, and then you will, you will participate and have that lifestyle. If you're not, then we're walking by sight, and we're trying to figure it out. Okay, God, do I have anything? Do I, what do I got left to give this morning? Obey the Lord. The, the eldership here loves you, church. This is not a, uh, uh, a pounding on you, but it's for us. It's for us. We want the church to flourish. We want your life to flourish in all the goodness and promises of God. And when we obey Him, that happens. You will become fruitful. And you will see His hand upon your life and see Him working. And you may be at that place this morning and say, how can that ever happen? How can I ever get to do that? Trust Him. Trust the Lord. Get in there. Do it first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says all these other things will happen. It's by faith, church. By faith. Father, we thank you this morning for a faithful family. Bethesda, house of mercy family. We thank you and we thank you for our guest here today, God. We know that you're here with us. That we walk with you daily. And God, we, we bring the tithe and the offering to your house this morning the house of prayer. We ask your blessings upon each and every one here today, God. May we we respond to your spirit today as as you speak to our hearts and you touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let's try that one more time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Woo! Woo-hoo. God is good. God is good even when we're not. Right. Amen. And we're not good often. Right. Amen? Amen. We're so glad you're here with us today and... We appreciate you coming to Bethesda. We know that you don't have to come here. You can go wherever you want to go. We're glad that you're with us today, and we appreciate you. And we want to just let you know about a few things that's taking place um, here at Bethesda and things that will be going on throughout the rest of this month and part of next. On September the 25th at 5.30 p.m., we will be participating, which that is... Tomorrow night, we will be participating in Feeding America. So come out. Bethesda has a good reputation of having a lot of people turn out. And so there's fellowship, and we help our community in the process. On September the 29th, there will be a men's uh, camp outing. Um, All that information is in the bulletin. And you can find out more information if you need to from the men's team. And they would be glad to share with you, you know, concerning that. Be a lot of, uh, there's food, there's, there is fun, um, fishing. Um, James is going to uh, show you how to catch big fish. Big fish. The big fish is going to help you know how to catch big fish. So come out for that. On October the 7th is Pastor Appreciation. Come out, spend time with our pastors and fellowship with family over a meal. Also on October 7th, for you that are older, Oasis Retreat, come to the pastor's thing first. For ages 50 and up, this is a free event um, at Camp Nikayo. Amen? Amen. 
so be a part of that, and we know that um, you will be blessed. How many of you know when we get together with God's people, we're blessed? Aren't you glad that we believe in fellowship here? Huh? We're not isolationists. You can't make it on your own. You can try, but it don't work. Just make sure when you're fellowshipping, you're fellowshipping around the right thing. Some people get together and fellowship around the wrong stuff. We believe in fellowshipping around the right thing. Amen. This time, Sister Rachel's going to come and she's going to share with us about some changes that are going to take place around here. Good morning. So parents, you may have received a letter that kind of looks like this with some information on it. If you have not and your child is in elementary, you will get that as you pick them up later, okay? But we thought as a whole it would be good just to kind of share what we're doing here. That way everybody understands and knows what's going on moving forward. We are super excited in the children's ministry. We have been working for a very long time um, to make this possible. Our children's ministry will be moving over to the, uh, the Life Center. Woohoo! We are super excited. <clears throat> so what does that mean? What is that going to look like for us, okay? That means it's going to be more secure. Your children are going to be locked down. We don't have to worry about anybody coming and going. I know that we locked down the church now, but this will be an extra precaution that we're putting in place, okay? So with that, there are going to be some growing pains. We know that. Anytime there's a change, anytime we grow, we're going to have growing pains, right? Yeah. So we just want to share so everybody knows. So check-in time you can check in your child between after or before 10 30 okay check in before 10 30 anytime before 10 30 okay so between 10 15 and 10 30 you will take your children if they are preschool or nursery and you will bring them back there will be a staff member to meet you in this back corner back here you're going to check in in the regular spot 10 15 10 30 you will bring them back to the corner back here in the fellowship hall a staff member will walk them over okay only a staff member. We're asking all parents to stay over here, okay? At 1030, if your child has not been checked in, there's no more entrance. That will be locked down. So that means for you guys as a parent, we need you to get here early. You should be coming early anyways. We want you to fellowship. We want to get to know you, okay? So 1030, we're locking down, so there will be no entrance. The only exception to that rule will be if we get a new family coming in, and they're being checked in, and maybe it's taking them a little bit longer, okay? But after that, your child will have to stay with you. If you need to change your child, there are changing tables in the restroom that we offer. These classrooms over here will remain locked from here on out, okay? Those will be Impact Christian Academy classrooms, so we are not going to be unlocking those classrooms. So I understand that something may come up. Maybe we got stuck in traffic. Uh, maybe our child got sick. Maybe we had to change them because they spilt not something down the front of them. But we are going to stay the same across the board. You will have to keep your child with you from here on out. 1030 lockdown mandatory across the book, okay? No exceptions unless you're new. And that will only be for the first time that they come, okay? So we do ask, please do not ask any leadership or ushers to unlock these rooms over here. We want to keep those rooms in good shape for Monday morning when school opens up, Okay. We got that? Okay. Um, parents, we are asking, please, please do not drop your children off at the gym. We want you to stay over here. The only people that are to be over in the gym are our teachers and our children, okay? If you are not teaching that Sunday, we ask, please do not be over there. We don't want that to be a place of fellowship. We want you to fellowship over here, okay? Um, in case of emergencies, we will be communicating with the ushers. Ricky, can you raise your hand so everybody can see you? Brad, he's in the back back there. And then Andrew. Those are the three ushers that will be communicating back and forth. So if there's an emergency that arises, if your child is sick, we will communicate with them. If you need to check your child out early, you will get with them and they will come and let us know. We do ask, too, that if you are leaving the premises, it's okay. But if you're just checking your child out... 
just to come back into the sanctuary, we do not want that anymore, okay? It is very important because people are in the moment, altar calls coming up, and we want to keep it quiet. We want their focus to be on what the Holy Spirit is doing in the room, okay? So we don't want you to check out your child early. If you're checking your child out early, we ask that you please go to your cars, and you can do whatever you need to do out there, but please don't bring them back into the sanctuary, okay? Um, we are also asking that... Um, your little stickers that you get for your child that has your little code, it is mandatory starting next Sunday that you have to have that code to check your child out, okay? Because we know that we are going to grow at Bethesda, so these are things that need to take place so that when that time comes that we grow, it's already in motion. We know how it's going to flow, okay? You have to have that sticker. Make sure, do not. If you have to stick it to your shirt, stick it to your shirt. And I also want to say about the coming early to fellowship, guys, I have five kids. I'm here at 8.30 every Sunday. We get up, four of us have to take showers, we cook a full meal, and we get here by 8.30. Set your clock just a little bit early. It's okay. I promise you're not going to lose that much sleep, okay? You guys can do this. We can do this. So when we pick up our children, when you pick up your children, you're going to go out this back door and across over, we will unlock that door to the gym. There's a little foyer there that has the bathrooms. You know you've seen it. There will be a table up. We are asking, please, parents, do not cross that table. They will scan your sticker code when you pick your child up, and we will have to check your child out from here on forward, okay? That is going to be a mandatory thing. Make sure your child is checked out. The teacher or an assistant will go get your child. After you have got your child, we are asking that you please leave. No fellowship. We want to make sure we are respecting the teacher's because we know their time is valuable. We have to clean up over there. We have to lock down over there, okay? So just make sure that you're prompt after service to come and get your children, okay? Um, so other than that, the main thing is 10, 15, 10, 30. Check, check in, get your child to the back. We walk them over immediately after service. Shake your heads with me. Promptly go get your child and no fellowship in the gym. Are we good? All right, we are excited about this stuff. We pray that you'll be praying. There might be times where we have to tweak stuff as we go. Just be patient with us with this, okay? And we know we're going to get through it together. So thank you for your time. So before I go, parents, you will not have to meet me after church. I know we had sent a thing about meeting. We just kind of done it across the church. If you have questions, I'm going to stay in the sanctuary. You can come to me if you have questions, okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Change is difficult. Anybody that really loves change, raise your hand. Now, some people, Pastor Fred, thank you very much. A lot of work has went into this. We have, we have a lot of people that have worked hard to get those rooms done and ready and spent countless hours, and we're thankful that we're going to be able to do that. We, we want, we're not operating in fear. Hey, listen, we're not operating in fear, but we want to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Amen. And I'll tell you what, um, our kids are valuable. Our kids are precious. And we're going to take care of those kids even if it makes people mad. <laughs> huh? How many of you know sometimes you do things and people just don't like it? But we're trying our best to have the very best that we can for our kids. And sometimes uh, we don't mean to, but we can disrupt that ourselves, right? Yeah. Our kids are important. All right, it's time for us to stand and go and high five, handshake, fist bump, hug somebody. Greet, meet and greet. Greet and meet, meet and greet.
So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I've got nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide. I will worship you, yeah. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah 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 We lift up our praise Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, I've got nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. 
Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I've got nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's give him praise. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You alone are worthy, God. Hallelujah. We celebrate you, God. Hallelujah. He desires our worship. He desires our praise enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise amen amen. we are entering into the last days. Jesus said that he was coming back after a church without spot or wrinkle or any such blemish. That we were going to be walking in rightness and wholeness he was coming back after a church that has made itself ready a mature mature believers did you hear that if you are truly born again, a lot, a lot of people have an issue with this, but I'm not apologizing for this. It doesn't make me any difference what background you come from, where you've been, what you believe. If you do not believe in being born again or you have not been born again, you will not enter in the kingdom of heaven. You will, did you hear me? You will not. Jesus said that we must be born again. But if you have been born again, if you have been born again, then there's only two types of believers. Did you know there's two types of believers? There's those who are immature, and there's those who are maturing. There's only two types of people in the church today. There's wise and foolish. The Bible says there was ten versions. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were focused. They were judging themselves. Do you know the scripture teaches us to judge ourselves? Did you know that judgment... 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of those be that obey not the gospel of God? What does he mean by that? He means that here we are, the house of God. Did you hear me? We are the temple. And so judgment must first begin at the temple. And he says in the word, If I judge myself... 
then I don't need to be judged. And, that, and the scripture also says, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. The five wise virgins had ex- were examining themselves. They were drinking from the fountain. They were fellowshipping with the Lord. They were doing the things that they were needing to do. They were being obedient to the word of the Lord and the commandments of the Lord. And their lamps were full. And they had oil. How many of you want to have plenty of oil? And you know oil represents the spirit. They had plenty of oil. But there were five other virgins. How many of you know they were all virgins? Virgins representing people who were believers. They were all virgins, but it it says five were foolish. Those five were going around and they were saying the right things. They were singing Kumbaya, my Lord. They were probably they were probably having manifestations and presence of things that were going on. They probably looked right. Come on. They probably looked right. They probably had been around and knew how to do things, that they had learned how to do things that they were supposed to do, but yet they weren't ready. There's lots of people today. Lots of us in the church that might not be ready. Do you notice how I said lots of us? Because being born again alone does not make you ready. He says when you're born again, he says, now make yourself ready. How am I going to do that? Man, I'm going to judge myself. Because how many of you know there's times you're going to get out of whack? Anybody in here ever got out of whack except for me? I, I, I hope I'm not the only one. I don't like to be all by myself. We get out of whack, we get off track, we walk in the flesh. Anybody ever had to deal with the Spirit? Anybody in here ever had to deal with the Spirit? And I'm not talking about you going and dealing with it and casting it out. I'm talking about you having to deal with it in your own life. Huh? You had to deal with it in your own life. Yeah, we're supposed to cast out demons. We're supposed to, in the name of Jesus, come out. Right? But how many of you had to deal with spirit yourself that was attacking you, that was after you, that was on you, that was taking you down a wrong path, that was causing you to believe certain ways and certain things and act certain ways and certain things? Maybe you were seduced by it. That's why he tells us in the last days, we have to be people who are teachers because teachers are people who have used the word of God that can discern both good and evil because the enemy is going to send people into the camp of the Lord to do anything and everything they can to deceive you. They're going to look right. They're going to talk right. You're going to see like they're right. It's going to look like they're just exactly what they ought to be. And they may just be well-intentioned dragons or they're one of the five foolish virgins. To draw you aside. To pull you off track. And I, I want to tell you something here at Bethesda. What we... What we believe and what we want to do here as elders is we want to confess to you that we are not always right. We make mistakes like everybody else. I know that shocks some of you. It's hard for you to believe. Sarita's not in here, so she didn't say amen. But it, it's true. We fight battles. I'll tell, tell you how you know I fight battles. I have kids. <laughs> I, I also look at somebody else in the mirror every day. And, and I fight battles. I also know what the scripture says. The scripture says he wants to smite the shepherds so he can scatter the flock. Yeah. But yet we, we, have, we walk in life like everybody else. There's no special place for me to walk separate and different from you. I, I want to walk in heavenly places. I want to sit 
in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I want to be in the Spirit seven hours, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But yet I'm still in this flesh. So the enemy sends seducing spirits after me, after the elders, just like he does you. The enemy sends uh, lies and deception after me, just like he does you. And we sometimes don't catch it right at first. Anybody ever, anybody ever went through something then shook your head and go, I should have saw that weeks ago. Yeah. Well, that's all of us. We're all in the same boat. We're all fighting those battles. We're all doing those same things. But one of the things that we are committed here to do, even though it might hurt my feet, even though it may hurt me, we're going to preach the truth. Whether the enemy likes it or not. Whether it applies to you or me or who, we don't really care where the word of God hits. We're not sitting back thinking, oh man, I got to say this today because you know what? Caden's here and he needs to hear it. I don't, listen, everything that I've got on this pad right here has been on here for weeks. How many of you know I have no insight to who's going to be here from one week to the next? Do you know why? Because some of you don't show up. (laughs) So I don't know who's going to be here. So I can't target somebody, but I am targeting what the Lord wants me to speak. Why? Because we have to get ready. We have to get prepared. We're not going to sugarcoat something. I don't care if you go out of here today fit with warm fuzzies and feeling like you got a dose of sugar. That's not my role, my responsibility. As a father, I am to tell you like it is in as much love as possible. How many of you think Jesus was still operating in love when he looked at the scribes and Pharisees and said, you bunch of hypocrites? Now, some of us would not think that was very nice. Oh, you know, Jesus, you ought to really be careful how you say things. <laughs> you know, in the, in the uh, show that everybody likes, Chosen, Jesus is preparing to preach the Sermon on the Mount. And he's walking around and he's practicing. And everybody's asking, yeah, I'm preparing. I'm, pre- I'm getting ready to, to share the biggest thing I've shared since I've been here. I'm practicing. I want you to know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords <laughs> didn't practice. He was ready. And so in that meeting, in that time, though, him and John the Baptist are walking down the road. Jesus and John the Baptist, his cousin. And they sit down, and Jesus looks at John and says, you know, John... You're getting ready to go in there. You know, John, you need to be a little bit more careful. Now, Jesus, this is Jesus and the chosen. John, you need to be a little more careful and cautious about what you say. You get yourself in trouble. And John's leaving and walking off and going like this. He's going, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to say it like it is. And Jesus is going, yes, my cousin John. I want you to know Jesus on this earth didn't look at John the Baptist and say, hey, John, when you go into town, be careful. Jesus wasn't looking at himself and saying, hey, when you go into town, make sure you don't look at those scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites and say too much. Now, listen, maybe you ought not say that thing about, "Woo, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Oh, man, you made white the outside of the sepulcher, but inside it's full of death. It's full of death. It's full of death. Jesus wasn't careful, but yet everything he did, he did it in love. When we say something hard or sharp, it's not that we're trying to be mean. We're trying to tell us to wake up because here it is. Here it is. Church is not asleep today. The church is in a coma. And the only thing that's going to set it free is the truth. Amen? Amen. Not your longevity, not how long you've been around, not who you think you are. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to move. And do a work. And so when we think about these things, we, we've been talking about obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. 
God's called us to obedience. Not, not the letter of the law, but yet Jesus did say, did he not? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But, but you see, in this church system that we're in, it's, it's this whole thing about this smothering grace. And how many of you are thankful for grace? I'm going to tell you what, if you don't celebrate right now that you're thankful for grace, something is wrong with you. I'm thankful for grace, but I'm going to tell you what the church has done. It's cheapened grace. It's made grace cheap because I want to tell you what, the kind of grace that my Bible talks about is not just a grace that forgives your sin and covers a multitude of sin, but it's also a grace that if you walk in Jesus in obedience, that grace keeps you. It keeps you on the right path. It keeps you walking straight. It keeps you upright. It keeps you in rightness. It keeps you in the spirit. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is able. And God's grace is not cheap. God's grace is not cheap. Cost the Father everything. Jesus gave it all up. But yet the church has cheapened grace because we do not want to offend anyone. We do not want to offend anyone. We want to say, and we use this excuse, and it's true. This is a true statement, but you can't use it as an excuse. Well, everybody falls short. What are y'all doing talking to me? Y'all aren't perfect. How many of you heard those things? And how many of you know that in and of itself is true? We all fall short. But the same Bible that I read tells us when you see your brother in a fault, go to him. Help him. Speak to him. Don't go being a critic. Don't go throwing darts. And don't go to 17 people before you get to him. Hello? I tell you, the church is full of gossipers. Church is full of people who sow discord. Church is full of people who call strife. Hello? And when you listen to the people that call strife, you're a strife person yourself. Did you see what I was meaning a while ago when I said sometimes you say things that can be a little sharp? But it's the truth, isn't it? But don't, don't excuse ourselves. It's just a simple fact that we didn't do it right. And so what do we do? We repent, and then we make it right. If somebody comes to you running their mouth off about something that you don't know the whole story, you're a sinner if you're sitting and listening to it and believing what they say. You ought to come and hear the whole truth and nothing but the truth, not just somebody's version of it. God wants us in the church to get ourselves Together, How many of you believe that we've had dreams and visions and things spoken over Bethesda? How many, how many believe? Count, now I'm not talking about one person. I'm talking about many different people have heard some of the same things, had the same dreams, and, and, and that, have, that God's going to do something. This is going to explode. God's going to move in such a way, and we're going to see all these things take place, and da-da-da-da-da. We're going to build, and we're going to do all this, and we're going to have families, new families that are going to come. How many of you believe that, that we've heard those things? Yes. How many of you believe God wants to do those things? How many of you know God's not going to do those things as long as we're doing our own thing? Walking in our own way. And how many of you know as long as there is strife and envy among you and jealousy among you, he's not going to work? God waiting for us to do what? Huh? Repent. God is waiting for us to allow the spirit of conviction to cause us that no matter what stature of life we're at, that we would repent, turn from our ways. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and and ask, they'll I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. How many of you want your land healed? What does he say about us? 
He says in James 1.25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continue, listen, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and is obedient to it, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Come on. Does that not excite you? He who looks into the perfect law of liberty, when I go reading this, I want you to know I'm not reading this and saying, oh, there's Rachel. Oh, there's, there's Angel. Oh, 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 there's the bees. <laughs> huh? Uh, when I'm up here preaching, when I'm up here teaching, doing whatever I'm doing up here, I'm not up here going, oh, ha, woo, God, you had me say that, and boy, there's Jay. No, he says, I'm looking into the perfect law of liberty. I'm looking at what it's saying about me. I'm listening to this living epistle, this living book speak to me. I'm listening to what thus saith the word of the Lord. And I'm saying to myself, how does that apply to me? Well, listen, I'm doing pretty good right here. But in this other part here, I'm not doing so good. I need to get my act together. I need to straighten myself up. I need to do what the word says. And when I, when I walk away, I got to keep that word hidden in my heart that I might not sin against the Lord. But what he says is, a person looks in that. And when that person continues, he continues in it, and he's not a forgetful hearer. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say to those of us that are over 40, we can tend to forget? And, and how many of you, how many of you will say, those of us that have experienced the over the 40 part can also say sometimes we don't hear right. Yeah. <sighs> huh? and, and, and we go off and we even tell the Lord stuff that we hear differently than the way the Lord spoke it to us. <laughs> yeah. right. Oh no, Lord, that's how I heard it. No. And, and I tell you what, if you go look into the perfect law of liberty, you'll find out that's not what he said. Come on. We, we might as well just be truthful. We're, we're looking for, God's looking for obedient servants. Did you hear me? God's looking for people who will be obedient. If you want to know why your life is in turmoil, it, it, it's got to be because you're not obedient. You have to first look at, am I being obedient? And if you can sit there and honestly in your heart and with counsel around you and say, yes, I am being obedient, and it's still chaotic, then the enemy is out to destroy you. But if you examine yourself and you're not being obedient, you're not walking in faith, you're not living according to God's word, you're not keeping the commandments of God, you don't have to go and counsel with anybody to find out what's going on. You don't have to say to them, you know what, I'm having all this, I just don't know what in the world's going on. No, 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 no. You didn't have to come to me for that or somebody else. You don't have to come, I don't have to go to anybody, I don't have to go to the elders. When things are going chaotic in my life and I examine myself and I'm not obeying this and I'm not walking in this and I'm not living this, I don't have to go to them and say, hey brother, I can't understand why in the world things are so dramatic and why so much junk is going on. I already know why. Stop being a hypocrite. It's not about that. You already know what's going on. Just return unto the Lord. Come on. You don't have to come to anybody. Now, if you need prayer and you need help getting the spirit off you so you can return to the Lord the way you need to, then yeah, come and let's get that spirit out of the way. Let's put him underneath your feet. Let's repent. Let's do what's right. But if not, you can do it yourself by what? Returning to the Lord. God wants us to be obedient. Why? Because he wants us to 
be fruitful. How many want to be fruitful? How many of you want to bear fruit? How many of you just don't want to have one apple on your tree? You want to have a whole orchard? Huh? How many of you know sometimes when you are um, wanting to bear fruit, sometimes your leaf or your branches have got down in the dirt? Anybody ever got muddy and down in the dirt? You're walking in this world, you're living life, things are happening, circumstances, people. Isn't that what the devil uses? Circumstances, people. Some people are well-intentioned, but he still uses them. And you're going through life, and, you know, man, your, your hands are hung down, your head's hung down, and you're realizing, oh, man, I'm not bearing any fruit. And my branches are in the mud, they're dirty, they're, they're nasty. But you know what happens, though? If we pray and repent and call on the Lord, the husbandman, the watcher, the one who provides and takes care of us will come. He will lift up your branches. He will dust off your branches. He'll get you out in the open where the sunlight can get a hold of you. And the sun of righteousness will shine on you and you'll begin to bud. But we let the enemy keep us down in the mud. And we keep doing it because we like self too much. Don't ask me, and I know you wouldn't say this either, but don't ask me why. It appears that some people just like being in the mud and the chaos. You say, well, what do you mean they like being in the chaos? Because if they didn't like being in the chaos, they would do what the Word of God says to get out of it. Do you know you do not have to live in drama and chaos? Do you know that you do not have to live in, 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 in strife and, and, and all that kind of stuff? You do not have to live like that. You do not, you're living below your privileges when you live like that. You do not have to live like that. You can take that spirit, that enemy, and put him down underneath your feet and say, No more. No more. By the grace of God, I will not live this way. If you're living that way, walk. Now, I'm not talking about, look, hey, how many of you know there's a difference in a blip? How many of you know there's a difference in a speed bump? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, man. Last couple of weeks, I've hit like, I mean, they were, you know how it, speed bumps are like set apart so you don't get too speedy. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> speed bumps aren't like one right after another. You know, you don't hop one, boom, you're on another, boom, you're on another, boom, you're on another. They're, they're there for your protection to slow you down so you don't run over kids or, or your neighbor <laughs> who you might want to run over. But the speed bumps keep you at a speed where you won't have an excuse, right? Man, this past couple weeks, it seemed like it was like blum, 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 speed bump, speed bump, speed bump. Everybody has blips. Everybody has a, a time, something that you have to wrestle with, you have to fight through. You might have to get a hold of your brother and say, hey man, I'm being tempted, tried, tested. I need you to pray for me and help me. Everybody has those times. But what I'm talking about right here is somebody who is finding their lifestyle is living that. Their life is living that. They're walking in that. And what you have to do is you have to start looking at yourself to say, what am I doing or not doing that the enemy is having his way with me? And correct it. You say, well, are you telling me to do works? Yes. Get, get your head screwed on straight. Stop going around saying stuff like, well, we're not supposed to do works. No, 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 no. Where in the world do you get that junk? When it comes to your salvation, you can't do enough works to get it. My righteousness is not by works. But when I give my life to Jesus, when I surrender my heart to God, when I yield myself to him because of my love for him, I'm going to bring forth works. I'm going to bring forth righteousness. If I'm sold out to Jesus, I'm going to bring forth fruits of righteousness. I'm going to bring forth works. I'm not going to want to sit and twiddle my thumbs. I'm going to say, what can I do, man? 
How can I help, man? You need prayer, man. You want to talk about Jesus, man. I want to do the things of God. He said, he said you're going to want to do these things. Works like he did. Not for your salvation. It doesn't make you more righteous. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about because of him I work. James said, if you say you have faith but you don't have works, your faith's dead. You're fooling yourself. If you can't see steady fruit in your life, you have to ask yourself, am I born again? If you don't see steady, consistent growth, I'm talking about we have a blip here, but that blip don't take you down to the bottom. That blip don't take you to an old lifestyle that you live on a consistent basis. That blip doesn't take you completely out of the things of God. That blip doesn't cause your character to act like it was when you didn't know Jesus. Listen, I've got blips. But when somebody cuts me off in traffic, even though I've gotten the flesh before and went back and said to them, you know what? Stop giving me the finger. I didn't go back and say, hey, look here, you, blankety, blank, blank. Or I didn't get mad and start screaming and call them names and cussing and swearing at them. That's how I lived before. Listen, I was, I cussed like a sailor. I didn't care who was around, man. I didn't have a sentence that didn't have an F in it. Not a good F either. Man, that was, my, that was my vocabulary. That was my life. That was my attitude. That was what I lived with. But I'm going to tell you what. It wasn't a lifestyle. It wasn't every time you turned around. It wasn't every time somebody made me mad. Why, why I don't I get why it's so quiet in here? That's just the truth. The devil, the devil does not fight me. He fights me. But I'm saying, then that fight, I don't get so tore up by the devil that I go out here and get drunk. Oh, man. He's beat me to death. I just think tonight I'm just going to juice it up. (laughs) No matter what? (laughs) So what? I can. (laughs) Right? We shouldn't be, we, we may have blips, but we shouldn't be in a way to where everybody around us thinks that's our character or that's our way of life. Obedience moves you away from that kind of stuff. James 3, 13 through 4, 8 says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show, listen, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy or self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, listen, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, come on now, willing to yield. You know what that means, willing to yield? It means you don't have to always be right. Why don't you, why don't you sometimes just yield? I, I mean, seriously. And don't fight over it. Full of, hold, listen, full of mercy. You know what mercy does? Mercy gives somebody also the benefit of the doubt. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about the love chapter. Anybody ever read 1 Corinthians 13? Huh? 1 Corinthians 13 says... Even though I understand mysteries and have all knowledge and speak with tongues of men and of angels, but if I don't have charity, I have nothing. 
Charity, you know what he says charity does? Charity thinks no evil. Charity does not vaunt itself. Does not exalt itself. Charity, charity loves. Charity is long-suffering. Charity is kind. Charity is gentle. Sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, don't it? He says this person here is full of mercy and good fruits without partiality. In other words, it's not any particular person. It's without partiality. Why? Because they're operating in the spirit of Christ. They're operating in the spirit. They're operating in a newness of life. They're operating under a different government. It's without partiality. And without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So what is he saying here? He's saying, look, man, look, listen. Stop looking at the toothpick in somebody else's eye and get the beam out of your own. Stop walking around as though you're so righteous that you feel that you can go around and pass judgment on everybody else. Be sure what measure of judgment you use, it's going to come back on you. Don't be an accuser of the brethren. We are playing into the hands of the devil. What are we facing right now? Father against son, mother against daughter. He goes on in chapter 4, he says, where do wars and fights come from among you? They, do they come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? Did, he, did you hear that? How many of you know he's writing to the church? Huh? Somebody a while ago probably said, well, I don't got none of that going on in me. I'm so pure and holy. He says here, do you not know where those things, when you experience those things, when you are encountering those things, do you not know where those things come from? They come from the war that's taking place in you, in your members. Because the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh because they are contrary to one another. In other words, if you stand somebody up here who's walking in the spirit that's a believer, they look different from somebody who's a believer that at the moment is walking in the flesh. That's why the world's rejecting the church. Because they don't see enough difference in us than the world. They see us act in the same way the world acts. How many of you know that's not supposed to be us? It's not supposed to be us. We are not to act the way the world. You, do, do you think about this? The early church was persecuted, wasn't it? They were persecuted. They were sawed al- uh, uh, alive. They were flayed alive with knives. They were crucified upside down. They were fed to lions. They were, they were after them. Why were they after them? Because they were right, self-righteous, because they were always out here uh, in their face? No, they, they were obedient to Christ. And so they loved the sinners. They loved the people that were around them. And what was happening to the people that were around them? They were abandoning their lifestyles, and they were giving their lives over to Christ. And so the people who were storekeepers, the people who were involved in all the garbage and all the junk in the world, the people that were soothsayers, the people who were involved in witchcraft, they were ticked off and mad. And so they would complain to the government, and they would complain to the Jews. And so everybody was after those Christians. Why? Because they were turning the world upside down for Jesus they weren't just after them because they said I'm a Christian they were after them because they were making a difference they were after them because they were obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and when they weren't obedient they got called out by the leaders hello when they tried to make themselves look good The leaders had discernment. They went and sold all their goods. They went and sold their house. And they came back and they laid at the apostles' feet. And they said to them, 
Hey, Ananias, is that what you sold it for? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And he died. Wife comes in. Did your husband tell the truth? Is that what you sold it for? Oh, yes, whatever Ananias said, that's what we did. The same men that carried him out are coming in to carry you out. They had things in their midst as well. They had issues in their midst as well. They had struggles in their midst as well. But yet they walked in the spirit and they dealt with them. What was the purpose of them dealing with the situations in the church at that time? It was to restore back to what was needed. The fellowship with God. That's why they did that. He goes on and he talks about. These are in your members, you lust, to do not, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot, cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns? jealously but he gives more grace therefore he says god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble humility cures worldliness therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god and he will draw near to you Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is a bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Woo! Man, the word of God is powerful. Did you hear me? Man, the word of God is powerful. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, I'm not going to read it. I'll put it on screen. But Paul admonishes a young minister, what? Hey, man, pay attention. In the last days, perilous times are going to come. Men are going to be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, lovers of money, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From this sort... You should turn away from them. Other words, if they have a form of godliness, but they're acting ungodly and walking and doing things they're not supposed to do, you should turn away from them if they won't listen to you. Hello? You say, oh, I just believe that we ought to stay right there. No, he says, if they won't listen, they need to um, let the enemy have his way so they can be brought back for the destruction of their flesh. Because if you hang around with that kind of spirit, you're going to be corrupted. Did you hear me? You may not have a problem with me yourself. Oh, you might have saw a couple things, but ah, you, didn't, you, oh, you blew it off. You didn't think nothing about it. Then somebody else comes along like Jessica, and she starts talking to you in, her, in a little subtle way of making it look like she just cares about truth. And you entertain it. Because of her bad spirit, you get corrupted. 
what you should tell Jessica is this. Hey, Jessica, you got a problem with him? No problem. I'm sure that's all right. Here's what you can do. By Friday, go talk to him. If he doesn't, if you don't go by Friday, guess what? I'm going to tell him you got a problem. You know what? That person's never going to come to Jessica again. Or Jessica's not going to go say that again. Hello? It, 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 it always gets quiet. It says in the last days, people are going to be covenant breakers. Listen. Covenant, covenant means I'm going to keep my word. And when I don't, I'm going to say, hey, hey Sean, I'm sorry, I didn't keep my word. Maybe, maybe even Sean has to bring it to my attention. How many of you know sometimes you just don't, you're just not, you just don't see it? Sometimes you're not realizing that you did it. And I, I mean, am I the only one? And so Sean comes to me and he tells me, and I have to, I, I have to apologize. I don't sit there and go, well, yeah, but... I need to say, okay, well, I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me. I broke that covenant with you. People are covenant breakers. In the last days, people are not going to keep covenant. People that preach about covenants, people that try to teach on covenant, they're covenant, 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 but yet they walk away from their covenant. I mean, come on, stop talking about covenant if you're going to just walk away from it. And, and people say, well, okay, we walked away, but you didn't come after us. Listen, I didn't walk away from you. Huh? If you don't come to me and say, hey, this is a problem I got, and you just walk away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text, hey, miss you, hey, what's going on, what's up? But I'm not going to come chase you down. I'm, I'm honoring my covenant with Doug Spain. I'm going to keep Pastor Doug right here. I'm gonna, I, I, he's, but if he walks off and just leaves, I'm going to say, hey, man, where you been? Hey, what's up? Oh, I love you too. And that's all he says. But he never comes. I'm not going to go run him down. He's a covenant breaker. He's broken covenant. All you members in Bethesda, listen, since I've been here since 2010, every single member in Bethesda has gone through some of the same stuff. There's never been any doubt what you can expect from us and about what we expect from you. Huh? It's laid out. Here it is. If you want to be a member, and you know at the end of the class even, all of you that's been in there, you'll say this. I'll say to you. Now, we're not going to force you to be a member. We're not coming after you to be a member. But we want you to be a member. And if you want to be a member, come to it. Isn't that right? After you've got all the information. Right? But as members of the church, we made commitments. To each other. We stood up here and said, before God and these witnesses, I'm going to accept this Bible as the word of God. The New Testament is my rule of faith, government practice, and discipline. I'm going to walk in the light to the best of my knowledge and ability. Amen. Huh? I'm speaking to members of Bethesda now. Not somebody that's here that's not a member. I'm speaking to the members of Bethesda. Everybody ought to do these things. Every Christian ought to walk in these things. But Bethesda, you made a covenant. You made a covenant to give of your time in serving the church. You gave, you gave a covenant saying that you would support as much as lies within you the ministries of Bethesda. You said in, the, you said in your covenant that you would pray for the eldership. That you would not make it about you. You said in your covenant that you would be a good steward. Hello, listen. Pastor Doug did a good job this morning, but you said in your covenant you'd be a good steward. You said in your covenant you would tithe and give offerings. That's what you said, members of Bethesda. And when you don't do that, you are a robber and you are a covenant breaker. And, and when you don't do that, then you understand Malachi... Because you're not being obedient, you understand what God is speaking to the Israelites. When he talks to them in Malachi chapter 3, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. If you're a member of Bethesda and all you do is tithe, you're still robbing God. 
and you are in trouble with the Lord. We don't come after you to disfellowship you, to cast you out. We encourage you. We want you to be faithful. You know why we want you to be faithful? So that Bethesda can have a lot of money. No, we want you to be faithful because we want the windows of heaven open over your household. And we want the devourer to be devoured off your stuff. We don't want to see you eaten up. Some of you are getting eaten up. Don't shake your head and say, why? That, this is why. Listen. He says, because you robbed me, you're cursed with the curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation, bringing all, bring all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me on this now. And says the Lord, and see, if I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out such blessings, that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. Anybody want that? I want that. And listen, and if you're doing these things, I will rebuke the devourer from your, for your sakes. Whew. How many wants to? How many of you've experienced the devourer? How many of you want him rebuked? How many of you want the Lord standing at the gate, going, "No"? Listen. Why am I going to rebuke him for you? So he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Some of your ground's being destroyed. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. Anybody in here want to be a delightful land? Huh? We committed ourselves. We committed ourselves as members of Bethesda to be faithful stewards in these areas. The leadership of this church is committed to being faithful in these areas. Because we desire for the Lord to have his way and for heaven to be open, not just on us. I don't want heaven just open. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Of, I, want, I want that uh, devour to be rebuked. I want the windows of heaven open over my life so it will pour out on Kay and pour out on others. That I can be a blessing, that I can be an encouragement, that I can see ministry go forward. Huh? That I can see the things that's needed. That's what I'm after. How about you? Bethesda, we made a commitment to be obedient to the things of God. I want to tell you something. Bethesda needs to make a commitment right here and now that we are no longer going to partake in pagan idols. I will not be speaking here again until November 15th. The elders are going to be speaking, and I'm going to sit over here, and I'm going to cheer it on. But we're entering into a season right now where the church has backslid. We're contaminated. We're infiltrated. And we justify it. Don't, don't practice the paganism of Halloween. It's nothing but witchcraft. It's nothing, and, and we disguise it as innocent because we want our children not to miss out on going around and getting candy. And we don't want to look like sores. And so we disguise it. We do things like trunk or treat. No, listen, listen. We don't need to have anything whatsoever to do with Halloween. Period. Now, you don't have to do what I'm telling you. I'm not a dictator, but I'm going to tell you what, wise counsel, you need to listen. There are no good witches. There are no white witches and then dark witches. There are no in-betweens. We are to leave off paganism. We are to get away from idolatry. We are to abandon anything, any shape, any form contrary to the things of the kingdom. And I'm going to tell you something right now. It's all right. It's okay. We do it. We put out things that have to do with the fall season. Yeah. There's a difference in doing things that have to do with the fall season than having a witch's hat out and a witch's broom and all kinds of decorations out, jack-o'-lanterns that look like little demons. Yeah. 
dressing our, we, we feel like we're okay because we dress our kids up in neutral outfits. No, listen, just come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's why the church got crucified. That's why the church got flayed alive. They did not partake in their junk. Paganism, getting ready to come up, getting ready to show its ugly head. You want me to tell you another one that you need to avoid? Christmas. Did you hear Jessica over there? <gasps> we disguise it because we say, it's Jesus' birthday. Christmas, 99% of Christmas is all about us. And we go out. Do you know most businesses make almost all their funds? In a year, in November, December. You know why? It's paganism. It's paganism. I, I, I don't care if somebody gets a gift. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. But I'm just going to tell you what. We, we have bought into a lie. And for the sake of us feeling okay about ourselves and our kids waking up on Christmas morning and getting their little gifts and doing their things, we have gone along with it and we have allowed ourselves to step outside of the kingdom of God to celebrate something that is not God. Because you know why? Same thing about Easter. Easter bunny, Easter eggs, and all that kind of stuff. We celebrate Easter. You know what Easter's about? We say, we say, it's about new birth. So we justify it. It's about the birth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get thrilled and we celebrate Good Friday, which Jesus didn't die on Friday, but we celebrate it anyway in the church because we don't have no sense. Huh? Serious. We buy into all this garbage, and the world looks at us, and the devil mocks, and the devil laughs. But you know what we should be doing? Why we shouldn't celebrate any of these days? Halloween, not at all. We don't even think about Halloween until October comes. But here's the deal. Christmas and, and Easter, you know why we shouldn't get caught up in it? Because we should be celebrating the birth of Jesus every day, moment of our lives. We should celebrate the resurrection of every day, every moment of our lives, not on some special day. He told us in his word not to celebrate special days. Everybody in here right now is saying, we're glad that you're not speaking again until November the 15th. <laughs> but listen, you go pray about it. You go think about it. You go dwell on it. You go study about it. You go consider it. And you just see how far away from the kingdom of God we have gotten in the church. Well, I want you to know I'm here to tell you the truth. Many families, many families spend thousands of dollars on Christmas because they're guilty because that's what everybody else does. We need to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We need to put on the garments of praise. Hello? Hello? We need to clothe ourselves in the righteousness of the Lord. And we need to lay these things aside and start applying ourselves to the kingdom message and be obedient to the word of the Lord. How many of you want to be obedient to the word of the Lord? How many of you you don't want to be puffed up because the word hits you. You want to apply it to your life and say, you know what? If I'm really ticked off about this, then maybe there's something in me wrong. Because I want you to know if I come to your house on Christmas and you got a Christmas tree up and some lights and things of that nature, I'm not judging you as an idol worshiper. But I just believe, I believe, for me and my house, we need to abandon that stuff and focus our attention on what is that really about. 
How about we all get together on Christmas? And instead of us giving gifts to each other, we go out and serve other people. How about if we all gather together on Christmas at the Life Center and have a, have a Christmas dinner and invite our friends across the street in and other people who may not have quite enough. And we love on them and give them some gift cards and tell them how much we appreciate them. And how about we do that and honor the Lord Jesus Christ rather than spending 1% of the holiday on Jesus and 99% on self. Come on. I'm guilty. I tell my kids, don't get me nothing because I don't want that stuff. Man, if you're going to do something for me, do it all year long. Huh? Don't be, don't be taking those thinking one day. It's like pastor appreciation. We're getting ready to have pastor appreciation. God bless all those that have went to work. I want any elder that feels unappreciated in this church to stand up and wave your hand. Any elder in the church, any elder in the church you feel unappreciated by the church most of the year, stand up and raise your hand. Anybody going to get up? Nobody's going to get up. You know why? Because you're always saying something. You're always doing something. You're always coming along. And you're always making us feel like we're loved. It doesn't take one day for us. If you're going to have pastor appreciation, they please appreciate me all year. Huh? I mean, thank God we're going to have a dinner together. Awesome. I thank the Lord for that. But don't wait till Pastor Appreciation to give me a gift card to Longhorn or to Texas Roadhouse. I mean, there's May, there's April, there's February, there's January. Come on. Come on, brother, right? Woo, hallelujah. There's after church on Sunday. We have 52 Sundays a year. Don't wait until October when they have Pastor Appreciation dinner for you to come and say, Oh, Pastor Jerry, I love you. Well, where you been all year? I mean, I mean, the elders will tell you, when I came here, I, used to, I was getting a first Sunday offering. And that first Sunday offering sometimes would be a couple thousand dollars. How many of you would like to um, go to work, get paid, and then once a month get a couple thousand dollars extra? Anybody? <laughs> Woo! Right now. So I'm not telling you that I meant to, whoo, it was What? Pastor Doug and I were talking one day, and I told him, I said, I don't believe this is what we need to be doing. And he agreed. Because I'm no better than the other elders. But, but, but listen, it's, it's not about that. And so you know what we did? We did away with it. And, and they bumped my pay a little bit. Woo, hallelujah. Thank God for them. Man, I don't have to have that to know. Because here's what the deal was. If people were mad at me, <laughs> if I preached like I am today and people were mad at me, guess what? The next time I got a, a first Sunday offering, it was $475. <laughs> Pastor Doug Spanhauer goes, That's, that is wrong. That's not right. Am I, am I lying? <laughs> because listen, here's the deal. I, I, they didn't give, fine. That's not going to control me or the eldership. That's not going to dictate our policies. You being puffed up at something that we do or don't do isn't going to change our policies. We're going to do everything we can to govern this church the way we feel the Holy Spirit wants us to. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes. Sometimes we're going to punt. But one of the things about it is if we err, we're going to err on the side of grace and mercy. <laughs> Come on, church, let's rise up and let's be what God wants us to be. Amen? Yes. Let's rise up. Let's stand up this morning. Let's put off all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Let's cast aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. 
Let's put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's abandon all idolatry. Let's abandon all paganism. It's not easy. Somebody told me one time, well, I'm not, no, I don't worship no idols. Well, is that why you scream out of church here on Sunday morning to get home to watch the kickoff? Hello? Come on. You might have an idol there. Oh, no. Let's cast aside all of our idols. And let's clothe ourselves in the righteousness of the Lord. Let's follow hard after God, his word. And let's be what God wants us to be. Let us have loving kindness and tender mercies. Let us be long-suffering and kind and gentle. Hello? Love suffers long and is kind. I wouldn't treat my worst enemies the way I have seen some Christians treat others in the church. Let's have loving kindness. Let's have grace and mercy. You're going to need it one of these days. Did you listen to me? You're going to need grace and mercy one of these days. You're going to need some love one of these days. You're going to need some long suffering one of these days. Give, and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. As they sing this song, the altar's open. Where are you at today? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you? How's the Lord want you to respond? Are we willing to lay it all down for the Lord? Are we willing to do what Jesus said? Hate our father, mother, sister, brother. Most all, hate your own self. And always put him first. I mean, are we even able, are we even willing to attempt that? Are we willing to respond to the Lord this morning? Because God says this, if you choose to work to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Are we willing this morning to lay it all down at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, here I am. Here's, here I am. My warts, my blemishes, my wrinkles, my sickness, my disease, my, my failures and my faults. Here I am, Lord. I'm repenting. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Are you willing? As they sing this song, the altar's open. We are standing and all free. Oh